Eternals is out now in theaters, and it is yet another film that you might call a deep cut in terms of the characters and lore that is being added to the MCU from the comics. The Eternals as a comic was created by Jack Kirby back in his heyday at Marvel, but it wasn't what you might call his biggest hit. I mean, not even close when compared to the fourth world characters that he made at DC Comics. And so many were curious about how the film would come off and are now very confused about that ending. So allow us to show you the Eternals post credit scene and ending explained. Eternals plot loosely. Okay, we are going into some major spoilers here. So if you don't want to hear any of this because you haven't seen the movie, you've been warned. The Eternals were a race of beings created by the Celestials to go and fight the evil monsters known as the Deviants. As a result of their mission, they were left on Earth for about 7,000 years and eventually ended up in the modern day in the MCU when they learned that the Deviants are back and that they need to be stopped. Not the least of which is because they've evolved and are able to absorb the powers of other Eternals. Not cool, but plot twist. It turns out that the Celestials had been lying to the Eternals for millennia and beyond, to the extent that Earth was not meant to be protected, but simply allowed to grow so that a new Celestial could be born from the energy of all life on the planet once it reached a certain level, which it did because of the blip. Well, because of course it did. Naturally, this caused some friction within the Eternals, and as a result of it, some tried to prevent the emergence from happening, while others were willing to fight and die to protect the people of Earth. In the end, good prevailed, obviously, but it came at a cost, not the least of which is that the Prime Celestial came to Earth to pass judgment on the Eternals that did remain and survived on the planet. He took them away and, well, movie over. Yeah, not exactly the best way to end a movie, but they were clearly setting up something, right? Well, yes, and that is where the two post credit sequences come in. Star Fox No, not the Nintendo game franchise, though the irony is certainly there for multiple reasons, but rather the character known as Star Fox was brought into the MCU via the mid credit sequence. In it, three of the Eternals who had gone to try and warn the others of their race about the Celestials and the truth of their purpose were boarded by a troll named Pip, who is voiced by Pat Oswalt, who introduced the Prince of Titan, the brother of Thanos. Don't know why you would want to go and have that moniker after everything Thanos did, but hey, oh well. And all around super guy, Eros, aka Star Fox. Oh, and he's being played by Harry Styles, so yeah, that happened. According to director Chloe Zhao, this was something that she had been thinking about for a long time. The idea of Eros and Harry came to me at the same time. It wasn't like I created this character and I think about different people to cast. Seeing his career, where he's going, what he's representing, him as an individual, he's very interesting, unique. And I thought, that is Eros. That's that character. He just happened to be Thanos' brother. I had this whole thing made up in my head, what their backstory is. I was just very, very excited when Kevin Feige went, let's do it. Zhao said that the former One Direction star, who has since transitioned to acting in addition to his solo career, didn't take much convincing to jump aboard. I think everyone loves working with Marvel, she said. He was game, yeah. His scene, Zhao said, was shot in one day with Styles arriving on set in a hoodie to stay under the radar which clearly almost worked because there was no clue as to his introduction in the MCU until the premiere. So, well done. But if you still have no idea what a Star Fox is or why we should care, hey, we got your back. Introduced in the 1973 comic The Invincible Iron Man No. 55 by Mike Friedrich and Jim Starlin, Eros hails from Saturn's largest moon, Titan, a locale familiar to Marvel moviegoers. Eons ago, a group of Eternals left Earth and decided to form a peaceful society focused on advancing science and technology. Eros is the planet's prince and ruler alongside his father, Mentor, once called Alars. Dismissed by Thanos as frivolous, he's a gallant adventurer and by his own admission, a notorious horn dog who's experienced more romance on more worlds than most sentient beings could imagine. Basically, he's relatively principled compared to the mad titan Thanos but his womanizing ways can make him a pretty unreliable ally. We would make a joke about Harry Styles here, but hey, we won't. Also, it should be noted that in the comics, Thanos is a player as well. Look it up. 
As for the name, it's his Avengers code name, but it's got a pretty ridiculous origin. While the Avengers quickly accepted Eros into their ranks, the president at the time, a fictional Ronald Reagan, felt that Eros was too provocative of a name for America's public-facing superhero team. So the Wasp suggested Star Fox, as he's a pretty foxy guy who's been out among the stars. Okay, remember this was the 70s, it was a different time. Speaking of which, Eros has consistently sided with the Avengers and has always stood against Thanos and his tyranny. But whether he's a good guy himself is often a question in the comics. In his earliest stories, he was portrayed as a shameless flirt, but still generally a stand-up guy. But later writers complicated his legacy by revealing a power that he never bothered to tell the Avengers about before. The ability to manipulate people's emotions. And that literally got him on the bad side of multiple female Avengers, including She-Hulk. Now it is going to be interesting to see how Star Fox and Pip factor into things. Because Arrow says that he knows where the three Earth Eternals are being held by their celestial overlord. But how can he help them outside of just finding him wasn't exactly made clear. So we'll have to stay tuned for that, and that's not the only thing the end credit sequences revealed. Black Knight In the movie, Dane Whitman, played by Kit Harington, is the boyfriend to Eternal Circe, and is actually pretty chill about her being, well, an Eternal, to the point that at the end of the movie he decides to open to her about his own complicated family history, but before he can, she's whisked away. Enter the final credit scene, and we see him opening a box that wields the legendary Ebony Blade, something that his family line has used for a long time, and that makes him the Marvel Comics character, the Black Knight, something director Zhao was very happy about bringing forth. I was a big fan of the character. I thought he would be very interesting to have a human character also with his own complicated history. You can sense he doesn't know what's going on with the Eternals, but there's something special about him. It's fun. The Ebony Blade is an incredibly powerful sword that protects the wielder from death and makes mincemeat out of nearly any foe. But wait, this powerful sword has a nasty little secret. A curse. The more blood it sheds, the more bloodthirsty its wielder becomes. Only those pure of heart can handle the sword. Hence why Dane in the movie was worried about wielding it, because he knew what it could mean for him and Cersei in the long run. Oh, and as for that voice you hear before he takes up the blade, well, that was Blade, the Vampire Hunter. And Kit Harrington didn't know that until the scene happened. I knew the line that was being said, because it was said out loud and it was in the bit of a script that I got. I only knew that was Mahershala Ali's voice just about three weeks ago. Chloe texted me saying that's what they were doing. It really excited me hearing that. He is one of my favorite actors out there at the moment. Now how Blade will fit into the Eternals is unknown but he has been teased for the MCU for a while now. It also means that Kit Dane's future isn't 100% certain as he didn't take up the blade thanks to, uh, well, Blade. So yeah, a lot to comprehend here and it'll be curious to see how it all goes. So what do you think? What do you think of this look at the Eternals and how the movie ended, who was introduced, and why it all matters in the grand scope of the MCU? Do you think that the Eternals was a good movie? Or do you agree with those who felt it was just too much for too many to understand? What did you think of the post credit sequences and which was your favorite? Let us know in the comments below and we'll see you next time on the channel.